Why don't we know that there were black slave owners in America? Why is that not taught? Blacks who own black slaves in the past. In exploring the historical complexities of slavery, it is essential to acknowledge a lesser known aspect of this dark period, the existence of black individuals who owned black slaves. This intriguing and often overlooked chapter of history reveals the multifaceted nature of human experiences during a time when racial oppression prevailed. The accounts of blacks who owned black slaves in the past beckon us to delve into a world that challenges conventional narratives and prompts us to question the societal conditions that led to such occurrences. As we embark on this journey through time, we are confronted with a stark contrast to the sinister agenda of white slave owners. Within this tale, we encounter individuals such as Anthony Johnson, William Ellison Jr., Marie Coincoin Matoyer, Paul Cuff, and a few more, who themselves were once victims of the very system they later participated in. Freed from the shackles of bondage, they dared to forge their paths towards economic prosperity, endeavoring to rise above the oppressive circumstances that once bound them. How did these black slave owners navigate a treacherous terrain, where the prevailing norms denied them basic rights and dignity? To truly understand the complexities of their choices, we must peer into the social milieu of the era, a time rife with prejudice and discrimination where freedom for a person of color was an arduous struggle and opportunities for economic advancement were scarce. These black individuals found themselves navigating a labyrinth of social hierarchies, seeking avenues to secure their livelihoods and provide for their families. Owning slaves, a practice seemingly in extreme conflict with their past, emerged as a means to achieve economic stability and societal recognition. Embark with us on this journey of discovery as we unravel the stories of blacks who own black slaves in the past and endeavor to honor their memories with a balanced perspective that does justice to the richness of their experiences. Before we get right into it, don't forget to support our work by liking this video, share with friends, and subscribe to stay with us always. Top 5 Black Slave Owners in the Past Number 5. Anthony Johnson from the year 1600 to 1670 Anthony Johnson was a 17th century enslaved man who obtained freedom and established himself as a successful planter on Virginia's eastern shore. He was one of the millions of people of African descent forcibly brought to the Americas and enslaved for almost 250 years in the United States. His harrowing journey through the Middle Passage and traumatic transitions to survive cruelty and hardship in a foreign land was not unlike the experiences of many others, except it was. Antonio a Negro was originally captured as a slave in Angola and brought to the Virginia colony America aboard the James in the year 1621. He was sold to an Englishman, Edwards Bennett's, in the colonial settlement of Jamestown. For nearly 12 years, he worked on a plantation for the Bennett's, a wealthy white family. The Bennett's owned Antonio but allowed him to farm a small plot of land for himself in addition to the work he did on the Bennett plantation. There he most likely grew tobacco and corn. He was also able to own several heads of cattle while still a slave. In March of 1622, local Tidewater Indians attacked Bennett's plantation, killing 52 people out of 57. Johnson was one of only five on the plantation who survived the attack. He gained his freedom in the 1630s after serving his indenture and became a successful tobacco farmer and landowner in Virginia. One of the first things he did was change his name to Anthony Johnson. Most slaves did not have last names, or else they used the name of their master. By creating a new name for himself, Anthony Johnson was announcing that he was no longer a slave. He continued to work hard and became a landowner in 1651, acquiring a patent for 250 acres of land, a fairly sizable plot. Later on, he expanded his holdings. Two of his sons, John and Richard, were also able to acquire land once they became adults. Anthony Johnson even made enough money to buy slaves of his own. Johnson's most notable legal victory came in 1655 when he won a court case against a white former indentured servant after a white neighbor tried to take away Johnson's slave. Johnson had gone to the court to protect his property. The court ruled in his favor and against a wealthy white man, resulting in him being granted the right to own and pass on slaves. Despite his status as a black landowner, Johnson's position did not protect him from racial prejudices as he faced legal challenges and discrimination during his lifetime. It is important to note that for a period of time in the 17th century, some of the enslaved, like Johnson, were able to gain their freedom, own land, and have servants. By the end of the 17th century, however, 
colonies began to make legal distinctions based on racial categories. The legal status of black people deteriorated while the rights of white European Americans increased. Johnson's descendants, who were classified as black, were stripped of the property they inherited from him. Number 4. William Ellison Jr. from the year 1790 to 1861. Originally named April, as children of slaves were often named for the month in which they were born, Ellison was the mulatto offspring of a slave woman and one of the Ellison men, William Ellison, who owned her near Winsboro in Fairfield District. In approximately 1802, he began an exceptional 14-year apprenticeship with a local cotton gin maker, William McCrate. While slaves sometimes acquired skills, they typically remained unskilled all their lives. April's apprenticeship allowed him to learn the craft of gin making, which also required mastering the skills of the blacksmith, machinist, and carpenter, along with reading, writing, and arithmetic. Very little is known about April's life beyond his apprenticeship, except that in the year 1811, he had a daughter by Matilda, a 16-year-old slave woman. As he gained more experience, April visited outlying plantations and did repair work there. During his free time, he worked for wages, and by the year 1816, he had acquired the funds to purchase his freedom. Once free, April relocated to the town of Stateburg in Sumter District. By 1817, he purchased and freed his enslaved wife Matilda and their daughter Eliza Ann. In 1820, April legally changed his name to William. In freedom, the Ellisons had three sons. The early antebellum decades were auspicious for Ellison, as the expanding cotton kingdom increased demand for his skills. After purchasing land in Stateburg in the early 1820s, Ellison established a shop and soon manufactured his own brand of cotton gin. While most of his patronage was local, he occasionally shipped the Ellison gin as far west as Mississippi. In addition to gin repair and manufacture, Ellison provided blacksmith and carpentry services. Slaves were essential to Ellison's success. He hired them, trained slave apprentices, and by 1820 had become a slave owner. Many of the men were trained artisans, but as Ellison acquired nearby farmland, most of his slaves were employed in cotton production. It has been estimated that by the 1850s, the profits from Ellison's plantation exceeded those of his shop. In 1860, he owned nearly 900 acres of land and 63 slaves, which he conservatively valued at $53,000. His estate exceeded the total wealth of the other 328 free blacks in Sumter District by several times, and he was among the top 10% of all slaveholders and landholders in the district. Ellison's ability to avoid offending white racial sensibilities and his demonstrated commitment to planter values through investment in land and slaves afforded him unique opportunities. For example, in 1838, Ellison purchased his family mansion, known as Wisdom Hall, from Stephen Miller, a former congressman and governor of South Carolina. His family worshipped at Holy Cross Episcopal Church, and while other black people were confined to the galleries, the Ellisons sat in their own pew at the rear of the main floor. Ultimately, Ellison could not escape the racial strictures of his society, and even he had to comply with the law requiring free blacks to have white guardians. On the eve of the Civil War, as white suspicion and persecution of free blacks increased, Ellison contemplated emigrating from the South. He died on December 5, 1861. Number 3. Marie-Thérèse Quansois Metoyer, from the year 1742 to 1816. This was a woman born at the lowest rung of her society, who endured deprivation, injustice, and hardship, not the least of which was her absolute lack of freedom. Marie Therese, called Coin Coin, a formerly enslaved woman freed in colonial Natchitoches, is an icon of American slavery and Louisiana's Creole culture. As an enslaved woman who became a free planter and entrepreneur, she symbolizes female self-determination in a world that imposed economic, legal, and sexual subservience on all women. Marie Therese Quantuan was born in the year 1742 at the Louisiana French outpost of Natchitoches, the fourth of eleven children. Her parents, Francois and Marie Francoise, were enslaved by the post's founder and commandant, Chevalier Louis Juchereau de Saint Denis. Their marriage was legitimate, and it was recorded in the parish church three weeks after Francoise's baptism in December 1735. This suggests that their marriage, like their religious conversion, was dictated by their master. As children, Quantuan and her sister Marie-Louise Ditta were trained in pharmacology and nursing. By these skills, the women earned a livelihood after gaining freedom through manumission as adults. Their other nine siblings would remain enslaved at various colonial posts from Natchitoches to Pensacola. 
Coin Coin had lost her parents to the plague when she was 16 and was taken into the household of her godmother, Marie de Soto. French colonial social policies condoned the sexual exploitation of enslaved people like Coin Coin, and the subsequent transfer of Louisiana to Spain subjected her to the age-old practice of punishing female victims of that abuse. However, these violations of her person would provide a pathway to freedom. By 1767, Quan Quan had borne five black children in the household of her godmother and third enslaver, St. Denise's daughter Marie de Neige, wife of Manuel de Soto. In dire financial straits because of her husband's imprisonment in Mexico City, Madame de Soto rented out Quan Suan that year to a new arrival at the post, the French bachelor Claude Thomas Pierre Metoyer, to tend his home and tavern. Quan Quan bore another ten children to Metoyer, the first five of whom were born into slavery and later manumitted by Metoyer. Prosecuted for these pregnancies by the parish priest, who branded Quan Quan a public prostitute, she was sentenced to the lash and public humiliation. In the wake of this punishment, which notably was not exacted upon the man she sexually served, Metoyer bought Coin Coin her freedom. With her freedom, a yearly allowance, and a small tract of 67 acres given by Metoyer, Marie Therese, with the help of her young children, began raising tobacco. She trapped wildlife and sold their byproducts at market, and she manufactured medicines, a skill apparently learned from her African-born parents, for which she and her freed sister, Marriott, were noted at the Nachitoki's post. In the coming years, Marie's fortunes grew. Contrary to modern expectations, she displayed no antipathy for the institution of slavery. Like many other freed women in Spanish Louisiana, she accepted slavery as an economic and social exigency and used it to create a legacy that has endured across two centuries. By 1816, at the time of her death, it's estimated that she owned more than 1,000 acres, with an estimated 287 slaves working the land. Her family's history and contributions to Louisiana's culture and economy continue to be celebrated today. Number 2. Paul Cuff, from the year 1759 to 1817. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Paul Cuff, a man of African and Native American descent, found himself navigating a treacherous world dominated by racial prejudices and oppressive institutions. Born in Massachusetts on January 17, 1759, the seventh child and fourth son of Cuff Slocum, an emancipated slave from West Africa and Ruth Moses, a Native American woman from Cape Cod, Paul faced a childhood filled with challenges, but his inherent resilience and determination would shape a life marked by remarkable achievements. In 1772, Cuff Slocum died, bequeathing this farm to his two younger sons, John and Paul, and it remained in their possession for the next half century. But in 1773, Paul initiated his seafaring life as a 14-year-old crew member on a whaling voyage to the West Indies, leaving management of the farm to his older brother. Cuff apprenticed as a shipbuilder and soon displayed an extraordinary aptitude for the craft. However, being a person of color, his aspirations were met with skepticism and discrimination. Undeterred, he honed his skills and eventually set up his own shipbuilding business in Westport, Massachusetts. With boundless ambition, and an enterprising spirit, Cuff expanded beyond shipbuilding into maritime trade, opening up opportunities that few black individuals of his time could access. After crewing on whaling ships in 1775 and 1776, and being taken prisoner by the British Navy on the latter voyage and held in a jail in New York Harbor for three months, Paul took up the challenge of penetrating the British blockade to deliver needed supplies to the residents of Nantucket throughout the rest of the war years. His success was not only a testament to his ingenuity, but also a challenge to the deeply entrenched racial barriers that characterized the era. Paul Cuff became one of the wealthiest persons of color in the United States and used his wealth to support local activities such as a smallpox hospital, an integrated school, and many people in difficulty regardless their ethnic or racial background. Throughout his journey, Paul Cuff fearlessly challenged the status quo, speaking out against racial discrimination and fighting for the rights of free black individuals. In 1797, Captain Cuffey, lamenting that the place in which he lived was destitute of a school for the instruction of youth, and anxious that his children should have a more favorable opportunity of obtaining education than he'd had, proposed to his neighbors to unite with him in erecting a schoolhouse. This became the cause of so much contention, probably on account of his color, that he resolved at length to build a schoolhouse on his own land and at his own expense. 
He did so, and when finished, gave them the use of it gratis, satisfying himself with seeing it occupied for the purposes contemplated. In 1811, Cuff embarked on a voyage that would become a defining moment in his life. He financed and captained a ship, taking 38 free black settlers to Sierra Leone, a land in Africa where they could build a new life away from the shackles of discrimination and oppression. This daring endeavor demonstrated Cuff's commitment to the cause of African-American empowerment and laid the groundwork for future emigration movements. Despite his achievements and advocacy, Cuff's life was not without complexities. He owned a farm in western New York where he employed African-American slave laborers. This aspect of his life sparked debates among contemporaries and historians alike, underscoring the intricate choices he faced as a free black man seeking success in a society that, paradoxically, condoned slavery. Paul Cuff passed away on the month of September 7, 1817, at the age of 58, leaving behind a legacy that inspired generations of African-Americans to persevere despite adversities. Number 1. Antoine Dubuclet, Jr., from the year 1810 to 1887. Antoine Dubuclet was a very wealthy man at the time of his passing in 1887. He was widely regarded as one of the wealthiest men in the entire South, more so than his white neighbors. Historians claim he was worth $265,000, which was some 200 times greater than the average annual income during those times. As well as his land, he also owned significant numbers of slaves. Unlike many slave owners of color of that period, Antoine Dubuclet was born to emancipated slave parents in the year 1810. His father was the part owner of a sugar plantation that was near Baton Rouge. After his father died in 1828, Dubuclet took over the reins at the Cedar Grove Plantation. In addition to the land, he inherited about 70 slaves. In 1833, the other partners in the plantation sold up, and the whole business was split equally between Antoine and his siblings. However, Antoine retained a position of leadership as the business continued to grow under his management, and by 1860, it was one of the biggest sugar plantations in Louisiana and had over 100 slaves working in the fields. The American Civil War sent the sugar industry into freefall. Plantation owners, both white and black, lost huge sums of money. However, Antoine had married well back in the 1830s. His free colored wife had wealth of her own, and he had used it wisely diversifying their investments. As such, Antoine came out of the war in good shape and soon entered the world of politics. He was nominated as the Republican candidate for the Louisiana State Treasurer in 1868 and won. Against the odds, he got the bankrupt state back into the black, ensuring his re-election in 1870 and then again in 1874. He was the only officeholder to remain in office during a minor coup d'etat known as the Battle of Liberty Place in 1875. He died in 1887 and was buried in the family tomb in New Orleans. In the year 1990, he was inducted into the Louisiana Black History Hall of Fame. It is important to acknowledge the complexities and contradictions surrounding the lives of these black slave owners. While they attained some level of economic success and autonomy, their ability to own slaves does not negate the broader history of the oppressive system of slavery that predominantly affected African Americans in the United States. Their stories are just a few examples that highlight the diverse experiences of black individuals in the context of historical slavery. This brings us to the end of this video segment. Do tell us what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to support our endeavors by pressing the like button in front of you, sharing with friends, and kindly subscribe to stay with us for more interesting contents in the future. Thank you for watching. See you soon.